Kurt Schlichter's joining me to discuss, well, pretty much everything that happened this past week. Colonel Kurt Schlichter, U.S. Army retired, Esquire trial lawyer extraordinaire. Early in, uh, it's early in L.A., huh, Schlichter? You're, uh, you look like a man of leisure. You look like a man of leisure. <laughs> I'm, not even out of, I'm not even out of bed yet. I don't know. I don't know whether to be excited or creeped out by that. All right, let's let's go yeah, into this. You so, should be totally creeped out. Creeped out's the right response. So sad I mean, sack. Look at this. Yeah, sad sack Comey. Now we find out Fox News broke it last night. <laughs> sack, sack SAC. Uh, yeah, sad sack sad SAC like Comey. Yeah. You know, I'm gonna just say, do you know the other acronym for uh, F- for people at the level of Andrew McCabe and Peter Stroke? No. Uh, uh, oftentimes they can rise to assistant director in charge, and I kid you not, the acronym is a dick. That is actually true. How 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 apt, boy! Yeah. Boy, the FBI sure taking a, a flaming uh, a flaming dive off a high cliff, huh? Yeah, sacks, Holy sa- cow. yeah, sacks and adicks at the top of the agency. But A-dicks. Listen, listen. Let me. Not, I, I know a lot of agents; they're outstanding people. These, but these three guys at the top, Stroke, Comey, and McCabe, really just they really poisoned the well. All right, Comey's memo. We now know that it was Peter Stroke, specifically Peter Stroke, who advised Comey. You change the wording from gross negligence, grossly negligent, however they were going to phrase it, to extremely careless. My argument has always been that gross negligence, I said it here on The Rebel, I've said it on air on other hits, gross negligence is a standard of criminal culpability that sets off a prosecution. Extremely careless is a jury instruction, but when it's uh, coming from the FBI, it's really just a shrug and a nod of the head. Talk to me about this, attorney's like uh, no, you're, 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 you're absolutely right. I think it's a great way of putting it. Uh, the, the whole idea was to clear their political ally. I mean, it, it, this whole thing is, I guess it shouldn't be stunning to me. But, you know, when, when something you know is confirmed uh, with bright flashing lights and sirens, right. sometimes you're kind of like, wow, you know. I, I, I kind of wanted not to believe it. But these guys were political activists. I mean, you know, Stroke and his, uh, you know, text to his girlfriend. D- didn't it? Didn't it used to be illegal to bang other members of the FBI that you weren't married I, to? Well, normally, wasn't that a, a thing? Yeah, normally it's a removable offense. I thought it was a removable offense. It's a removable offense in the army, right? If you, uh, it's have a crime in the army. Right, adultery is a crime affairs, in the yeah. army. Um, you know what's bothering yeah, me? But wait. he's still there. Stroke's still there. He's still there. He's one of the crew. But here's, Andrew here's, McCabe's still there for reasons that... Th- that that one know. is baffling everybody. But here's the part that concerns me that no one in the media seems to be addressing. And maybe they're not addressing it because they didn't work inside the system like I did. And they, the protocols are lost on them. But, but we've got some really smart people that get it. I don't know why they're not addressing it. When Comey sent the email... You Stroke and McCabe and Rabicki, the chief of staff at FBI, and all these other, I think I said his name right, all these other people that were, that we now know were part of the collusion team Hillary. He, and he asked for their opinion on, on the wording in the memo. And we now know that Stroke downplayed it. Who was conspicuously not CC'd, who was not consulted, were those supposedly reasonable prosecutors that never would have prosecuted Hillary Clinton. No one met with the Department of Justice and asked the Department of Justice who would have prosecuted post-indictment if they thought, these are the lawyers, by the way, if they thought that the culpability should be reduced from grossly negligent to extremely careless, only FBI agents who had huddled in McCabe's office and talked about Trump being a loathsome human being and how Hillary should win 100 million to zero were consulted, and the Department of Justice still remained silent. Kurt, I can tell you this, if an NYPD we had made that determination without without uh, consulting with the Bronx or Manhattan District Attorney's offices where I work. We would have been excoriated. The DA's office would have called our bosses. We probably would have been kicked off the case and maybe never allowed to work an investigation with that DA's office again. No, I, I, I the Department of Justice uh, was perfectly happy for the FBI to take the heat for doing what the Department of Justice would have done. The Department of Justice would right. never prosecute Hillary. Well, that's right. She could have been standing there with a bloody ax over the corpses of her many victims. Uh, and, and, you know, they'd look at it and go, eh, just, just extremely careless. No, they would have looked at it and said, Hillary Clinton, the great vampire killer. Hillary Clinton, the great the zombie great killer. vampire Protects killer. Protects America. The zombie yeah. killer. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, my they, they, God. They've spun it. I'm dizzy. I'm nauseous from the spin. But it's it, this is... Uh, you know, what does it take at this point? Well, let me ask you a different question. If you tampered with a prosecution, say you were defending somebody, 
and you tampered with the prosecution to this degree, what would the standard be for you to be censured, disbarred, and potentially prosecuted? In your opinion as an attorney, you know, a blue sky opinion here, do you think they've crossed that line? I mean, I think they have, but I want to hear it from a lawyer. I, mine, mine is an emotional response and a response from the lens of a cop. So we tend to be pro-prosecutorial. As an attorney, have they crossed that line from censure to disbarment to prosecution? Well, these guys, I mean, these guys weren't lawyers, but they were, uh, well, actually, well, Comey, 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 Comey is a lawyer. Yeah, Comey a lawyer. is a lawyer. Yeah. Um, I can't imagine he'd actually get disbarred because, you know, the bars are in the, the bar, I would assume, is in the Pretty left, cahoots, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this is all so outrageous. We're, we're in kind of uncharted territory here at, uh, with the level of outrageousness of this. I mean, you have the FBI sitting around deciding, well, let's start a prosecution of a political opponent of our boss just in case he gets elected. I mean, it's just... It, 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 it is, yeah. It's like Watergate times a million. And of course, our media doesn't care and the Democrats doesn't care. Everything's a lie. Everything's a scam. Uh, and this is why everyone should buy uh, buy guns. <laughs> no, it's true. <laughs> but, but because, it's, because I, I mean, I mean, really, if, if you're going to knock the pillars out of society, uh, the pillars out of our system of government... Uh, you know, eventually it's going to collapse. People aren't just not going to play along and kind of shrug and go, oh, OK, well, all right. Well, there are certain rules for you guys. And then there are you know, more onerous rules for us. Let, let's talk, a little, let, let's talk cool. about Rosenstein's uh, Rosenstein's testimony. Uh, you watched it, right? I mean, I, it, I, I watched some of it. Yeah, the, the, uh, I'm a little annoyed at some of the Republicans who decided to do monologues rather than, you know, cross examination. So I saw Trey Gowdy. And he's got all these times where he can really put Rosenstein on the spot. Instead, he just keeps talking. Listen, Trey Gowdy, he's a phony. Yeah. Trey Gowdy, yeah, when, I, I, he when, lost me years great, ago. Yeah. Yeah, when's the great prosecutors show up? Yeah, no, he's... He, I just look, see a look, guy in a bad tie who looks yeah. like uh, he should be cu uh, cruising in a Camaro around a, a, a high school at <laughs> yeah. lunch. Yeah, with the, but now he's trying to be sophisticated. He brings the glasses down. That's when he's serious. Yeah, yeah he's he looks serious, like Trey Gowdy. Yeah. And, uh, dazed and confused. He looks like the little. I actually think he looks like that little elf in the uh, in the Rudolph movies. He does look like that. I, mean, <laughs> I don't. I don't need the elf. I need the heat miser. I need the heat miser. No, but look, Gowdy. You know, I've I've long said this for about uh, two years now. Gowdy has always been. Uh, uh, he was Boehner's, then Ryan's lapdog. He talks tough. He placates us. He, tell us. he tells us what we want to hear. But at the end of the day, he does nothing. And I found a video. I tweeted it out the other day. And it's on my, my Twitter timeline now, if you dig back, where John McCain was praising Trey Gowdy in 2014 as being the next Lindsey Graham. And he jokingly said he's just like his uncle, Lindsey Graham. So Trey Gowdy gives us a dog Ugh. and pony show. Now, I do think Jim Jordan is the real deal. I can tell you, being from Florida, that Matt Gates and Ron DeSantis are the real deal. Matt Gates in particular, he is a hardcore conservative, pro Second Amendment, pro small government guy. They're, they're hammering. They are hammering. We're hammering yeah. Rosenstein with questions. You know who else I'm impressed by? Because he's got a much more subdued style. But he was a DOJ prosecutor as Raul Labrador from Idaho. He's, he's oh, calm. Yeah, yeah. He's collected. But, man, if, if you listen to his line of questioning, he's, he's hitting it on the mark. Now, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about David Cicilline from Rhode Island. <laughs> Luis Gutierrez. Oh, wait, guy. wait. It gets, it gets better, Schlechter. Luis Gutierrez from Illinois and Hank Johnson Guam's well, going to tip over from Georgia. I mean, I want them to stay in Congress just for the sheer amusement value of these hearings. Well, this is a lean guy. He looks like he's running a, uh, you know, uh, uh, run, <laughs> running a betting parlor. In the I, was gonna say, yeah, I was going to say it because I can say it. I'm an Italian guy. He looks like the guy who runs the wise guys poker game. Exactly. It, it, behind exactly. the social, behind he's, the social he's not, club. He's yeah. not the head wise guy. Exactly. He's not tough enough to be one of the enforcers. No, he's not even a maid he's guy. He's no, the he, guy who carries yes. stuff from one uh, one place to another. He's the, he's the bag. yeah. He's the bag man. He's not. He wasn't. He didn't have the goods to be a made guy because he couldn't pull. You know, no, he's not going to be made. Yeah, he, he's peripheral. He's going to end up hanging in a uh, ice yeah. truck. And he's good with numbers. He graduated high school, so he's the numbers guy. He gets to run ah, the game and hold them up. The numbers <laughs> guy because he has all his fingers. Hank Johnson just amuses me to no end. I, oh. I don't even know. I don't even. I, part of me thinks that he's a parody of himself, that he's a hardcore conservative just playing a liberal dem because nobody, nobody can be that much of a gift to our side. Nobody. Oh, the Guam tipper. But th there is nothing better than the look on that admiral's face when he asked him the question about Guam tipping over. That man should have, 
That, <laughs> I don't know if there's an award for composure at that level of the military, but man, he should have gotten it. <laughs> it's kind of like, what? All right, now one close to my heart. One really, but let, wait, wait, before we go to Rubio, let's go back to Rosenstein, though. I, I thought Rosenstein's oh. testimony was a big nothing. It was a three hour or so waste of time where we learned nothing new except the fact that Rosenstein thought Robert Mueller was a man of integrity and that there was nothing at all wrong with the investigation and there were no conflicts of interest. Or we should just wait for the Department of Justice Inspector General's report. Now, interestingly enough, this is more of a, of a statement than a question. I had lunch uh, yesterday with three very senior federal agents very, very close friends of mine, and they work in the internal affairs. Uh, they actually run the internal affairs group of the particular federal law enforcement agency in which they work. And they told me that uh, OIG, Inspector General Horowitz, has no love for federal law enforcement agencies because he really has, he's on a mission to prove he's independent. And they told me he's been very heavy handed in the past with the FBI, with the DEA, with the ATF, and with others. So they, they personally we're 50-50 on whether people are getting a pass. They're not saying it's 80% people are going to get a pass. They think there's a chance that Horowitz will actually do something. I, I, I should hope so, but frankly, I, you know, my, I don't have a lot of faith that the fix is in. The establishment is yeah. fighting for its own survival. That's how I feel. Uh, you know, that's how I feel. They have a yeah, little more faith and it's, in the system. Yeah, and it's, it's so destructive. These guys think, you know, we'll just, we'll just BS our way through this. We'll just push on through this. This whole Trump craziness is going to go yeah. away. Hey, look, we, we barely be, we barely were able to beat the guy who cruised, uh, you know, malls for teenagers in Alabama. We're winning. And, uh, yeah. you know, they, they think that this is all going to blow over. I don't, I don't think it's going to blow over. You know, real, real, I, I've done Roy Moore ad nauseum, but, but you and I have spoken about this. Like, I don't think Roy Moore is indicative of anything. I think it was just a bad... I think Roy Moore lost the race more than Doug Jones won the race. I think Jones sticks around for two years. He, a Republican oh, crushes true. him in the next one, and, and well, we forget the, Well, the thing him. about Roy Moore... I, I, I'm annoyed with Roy Moore because he is a terrible candidate. Horrible, I consider horrible, politicians horrible expendable candidate. when yeah, it, yeah. it became, became... Yeah, when it became difficult for him to win, he should have left. That's right. uh, the That's best right. case scenario for this guy, and he he, alien, he made a lot of conservatives stay home uh, because you know the best case for this guy was you know I cruised mall for teen moved malls for teenagers. Well, well, like that I, was his but, admitted Kurt, like best I, case. Right, like terrible I said, like candidate. I said, he, Screw listen, this guy. Who on his first of all, he ran. A, he was a terrible candidate who ran a terrible campaign. Who on his team oh, advised? Oh, the campaign was just devastating. Who, I want I want to know who advised him. I really want to know who advised them after the allegations. No go, one. To, wait, exactly. To, to say, to say to the cameras, well, yeah, I did date teenagers if their parents were cool with it. Like who told the creepy 70 year old in a yeah. cowboy hat that uh, that I was mean, a good I, messaging idea? At the idea. end of the day, that's just, that's, that's hard to get over. Uh, whether it's fair or not, I think the accusations of criminal wrongdoing were unfair in a lot of ways. And I don't believe anything the all red girl said. Right. And right, the right. other one, I don't really believe either because he's pedo perverts do it over and over. But what he did admit to was enough to keep a lot of people home. That's and, right. And that was certainly the market. It kept, look, it kept, it kept moms uh, and dads. Here's the, here's, the, yeah. here's the thing that really gets me. Let's put aside the fact that he was a crummy candidate. And he, he was. He was a right. crummy candidate before. He, he was a crummy <laughs> candidate after. Um, he ran a terrible campaign. They got Joe Trippy down there and ran a data-driven modern campaign against oh, 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 him. Oh, listen, that I gave, focused uh, on getting yep, out the vote yep. and highly democratic. I gave credit all day long to Doug Jones for yep. running a great campaign. And and Roy Moore used a guy named Brett Doster here out of Florida. We've crossed paths. He was Jeb Bush's guy. And they ran a very Jeb Bush-esque campaign. There was no opposition research on Jones. There was no pushback on the message. The only, the only comment, the only uh, uh, rapid response to the message was, yeah, I dated teenagers when their parents were okay with it. I mean, there was literally... It, it yeah, that, could, that response could have waited. You didn't need a rapid response. Or how about you don't say yeah, it? I like teenage girls. What 30-year-old man didn't? Yeah, how about you don't say it at all? How about you just, but, and then, he, then the weirdness of riding there on the horse. And, and look, we are at a point in history, yeah. right? Yeah. It, it, might, it might change. And it, and it hasn't always been. But we're at a point in history where economic and national security populism is reigning supreme in terms of political messaging. And we've got a guy talking about the LGBT boogie lady boy under the bed. Oh, they're going to come and yeah. get you in your sleep. You know, nobody. It, the message just didn't resonate. Yeah. I mean, it was just it was just a terrible campaign. Yeah. Uh, and, and, I, I'm, and I'm going to write about this at Town Hall Monday. I think it, there are lessons there for us to take. And there are, there are lessons we should learn. And false lessons we shouldn't. Uh, right. I don't think that we should somehow 
make ourselves feel better because he was a uniquely bad cam- uh, candidate in a uniquely weird situation, which is all true. Um, but what we're looking at is motivated Democrats right. who are using modern campaign techniques to target winnable races. That's what they did in Virginia. They went in and targeted these races. And, and look, what and they, they, what they do, into it. That, that's right, what they do. And yeah, I, we I actually, weren't looking. Yeah, I had a meeting yesterday with a uh, guy running for, I won't say any names, but they're running for Congress here in, in Florida as a Republican against a very bad candidate. They're running against a very bad candidate and uh, a Democrat, incumbent Democrat. And I, they had asked me where I think, you know, doing what I do, the Republican Party lacks. And I said, well, the Republican Party absolutely sucks at get out the vote efforts and minority outreach. Yes. And the Democrats are pros at get out the vote and minority outreach. They're pros at grassroots. Roy Moore had no grassroots infrastructure and he all but ignored. None. It was as if there were no black and Hispanics in the state of Alabama to the Moore campaign. And you know me, I'm not a guy that says race. It was just racism. It's just terrible community outreach. Moore's entire campaign plan was Alabama votes Republican. Let's go to sleep. That was what it was. There was nothing yes. done. He, he disappeared the voters. last four days of the campaign. Yeah, the most critical time it's when most stupid. candidates are out 19 hours a day, not even sleeping. He was gone. He was MIA grooming his horse to ride to the polls. It, the whole thing yeah. was, was ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, we, we have to do a few things. We have to be more ruthless with our candidate selection. Oh, yes. Uh, for us hardcore conservatives, sometimes that's going to be me, me taking a guy who's more liberal than we like. Uh, for uh, squishes, it's going to mean taking sometimes mean taking somebody more conservative, more than hard, you like. hardcore than you like to hold that seat. Yeah. Now let's talk. Yeah, about we that. have to we have to find the people who are going to win, and we have to do data driven campaigns That's right. that are modern that focus on social media. What was social media? What, did you ever see Roy Moore's Twitter feed? Honestly, there was nothing on there. I, this is exactly the his horse has one. I have with his candidates. Sassy's Twitter feed. That's right. Listen, I have this conversation with candidates daily. The world now exists on social media. Senior citizens ramp onto Facebook. But the tr- you know what the problem is? The traditional campaign consultants, especially the group that more use, because I know who they are, they make a ton of money on media and mail, right? These consultants make major commission vigs on, on television ad buys and mailers through the mail. And they yep. don't want to know about social media because dollar for dollar in the races that I've, I've worked on and been around – what you spend two thousand dollars for in mail can be done for about eighty bucks on Facebook, and there's no yeah. vig. There's no vig for these guys to make, so they stay away from it. The Democrats have embraced it. Obama brought them there masterfully back Trump in two thousand eight. Bra- Trump embraced. Oh, no, Trump won because of it, but but Trump's an anomaly. The I'm talking about establishment players. The establishment Dems. Oh have yeah, embraced the establishment it. guys don't want anything to do with it. That's Remember, why you can be yeah. you can be a successful Republican. Campaign consultant who has never won anything. That's right. And listen, Rick Mike Wil- Murphy, Rick, Mike Murphy, Rick Wilson. These guys make a lot of money on media buys. That's why they're so hysterically never Trump. It's not ideology. Trump espouses all the stuff they've talked about for decades. It's that he took the ability for them to make millions of dollars away by using a new playbook and taking the media buy and, and the mailer consultants out of the equation. And he went to digital. So Brad Parscale and his digital team made nine, ten million dollars, and all the traditional guys that waited in line made nothing. That's why they're hysterical. It's all about money. Well, yeah. Look, any candidate who doesn't go out and hire somebody like you, and somebody that, who works, that's with why them, they like, lose if they don't hire guys. Like uh, it is really screwing up. Yeah, yeah. It, I'll tell you what. If you and I had been handed Roy Moore in October. He'd, you know, be a, he'd, be the sitting, he'd be the sitting he'd be he'd be senator, senator elect right today. Yes, he would. I, you know what? I firmly believe well, that. The, 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 yep. the, fir- the first thing, he wouldn't have gone on Hannity un- uh, you know, as unprepared as that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, judicial nominee who didn't, you know, who'd never done a trial yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and couldn't explain first why all, he'd, 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 he'd still be a lost, judge. He'd have lost his cowboy hat, put on a more modern suit, and gone to the polls in a suburban or a pickup truck, not on his horse, and he would have shut his mouth about dating teenagers with their parents' permission. I mean, it was... Yeah, like, he would have gone on Hannity and, and explained, look, I, I, you know, you just told some terrible lies about me. Gloria Allred's telling lies. That's right. The lies are lies. And we would have I mean, run you know? and we would have run against Gloria Allred and Doug Jones and really turned off yep. Alabamans. They all well, there's a Gloria lot of Allred stuff about Doug Jones. Did you, did you know he had a first wife? Look, did Doug, you know his divorce was very ugly? The, the oppo on Doug Jones was non-existent. You know who he reminds me of? Do you remember Tim Conway? Tim Conway and yes. Corbin. Doug Jones just reminds me of that that old comedian Tim Conway. I, I don't every yes. time I look at him, I just think of the old like he's Tim Conway Harvey Corman skits. Yeah, weird, very very odd. 
All right, let's let's. We were talking about squishes, and we were talking about having to uh, accept politicians that leave a bad taste in our mouths. I'm here in Florida. We've got to talk about grandstanding Marco Rubio. Now, now, now. Full disclosure: leaving leaving a bad taste in your mouth. Oh God! Oh God! Let's not go there. <laughs> I know it. I know. Clean it, it out with water. Oh Lots God! Of water. Oh, God. Big, Hold little, on, little, I'm little do a Marco Rubio tribute. Wait a minute. Hold on. Ready? Now I just need some foam. I got to do another. Without the prop cap. Uh, <laughs> okay, so listen. So here's the thing, right? Full disclosure. I donated and supported Marco Rubio vehemently when he was a state legislator here in Florida. Donated a lot of money to his campaigns. I voted for him twice as a U.S. senator. And to say, and I put this out on Twitter yesterday, to say I have buyer's remorse is an understatement. My quick analysis. The tax reform bill, if passed, gets the Dow close to, if not above, 30000 People with 401ks, with investments, even a couple of shares of stock that their parents gave them in Disney for their high school graduation, stand to make thousands of dollars. And Marco Rubio is threatening to hold it up over an additional 500 bucks in child tax credit, where even if a deal is cut, he gets $250. So he's willing to say he already got it doubled. It was 1000 He got it to 2000 Now he's holding it hostage, playing McCain 2.0, maybe McCain 3.0, if Graham is 2.0. He's holding it hostage over what might amount to 250 bucks, a big, what, what does that break down to? A big 20 bucks a month, right? $20.50 a month, five bucks a week, 80 cents a day. He's willing to take thousands of dollars in stock market increases and, and profits out of people's investment plans to grandstand. To me, I think that's reprehensible. It's not conservative. It's not good for America. It's only good for Marco Rubio and his establishment buddies who still have a petty vendetta against Trump. What say you, Counselor Slichter? Well, first of all, Marco's going to fold because he's a gutless wuss. Got no choice. Uh, this is grandstanding. He's going to fold. I don't. I, I think uh, Corker, Flake, Collins, and, yeah. and maybe Mikowski. some others will, at the last moment, screw this. I, I don't see this thing passing. Yeah, Murkowski, Mikow- Collins, you're right. Both. Flake, even even if McCain, if they wheel him back in, I just McCain's. But McCain said he was a yes, so I don't think he wants to go out. McCain might not have long to live. I mean, I don't say that. In a cavalier way, I don't care how I feel about the man politically. No, it's just you a feel fact. bad for his family, right? Yeah, but it's a fact. But yeah. uh, but I, but I think you're right. Obviously. I think Flake, Murkowski, Collins, and Corker sink this thing. And Mike Lee now is saying he'll be a no, and that which is really disappointing. He'll be a no if the tax credit's not expanded, which I think is ridiculous. Over a couple of hundred bucks. To me, it's just ridiculous. And especially on the heels of the more loss, we need a galvanized GOP. We need this win. You don't hold this win up over two hundred and fifty dollars. Well, 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 remember these guys don't want to win. That's right. They, it, That's it, right. It's not important for the party or conservatism to win. What they want to do is create a situation where they have to be invited back to fix everything. Let's burn it down, and then we'll fix it. That's right. Uh, That's right. Now, I, look, I, I I'm all for burning things down once in a while, but that's a dangerous strategy. Uh, do they think that somehow people are going to come to the Jeff Flakes and the uh, uh, Bob Corkers uh, uh, to rebuild the Republican Party? Their time is gone, and they ought to leave with some dignity. Leave with some uh, dignity. Speak, but speaking that, but of that, we, we found out yesterday that Paul Ryan is probably going to retire before the 2018 elections. Yeah. <laughs> Who'd notice? Well, actually, you know, Paul Ryan has done a, <laughs> an adequate job lately. I mean, he... he, he keeps putting up bills and keeps getting them passed, and then the Senate screws it up. For, you know what? So, for, I mean, for, right for now, Paul Ryan, he's I, shutting I, up, and he's doing, yeah. he's passing things. I mean, that's the least annoying Paul Ryan, though Paul Ryan's super annoying. Oh, he's terribly, terribly annoying, that that, that weird little grimace that he does. But you know what? In yeah. fairness, look, the, guy, the guy annoys me. But yeah, at least he's letting Bill see the light of day. I understand why he wants to go. I mean, if I'm Paul Ryan, I'm in my mid-40s at this point, and the guy's right, right around my age. He's probably, I mean, the guy's going to step out and make two, three, four, five million bucks a year at a big bank because he was the budget guy. So I, I understand why you'd want to go at this point. Enjoy the money. Yeah. Make some money. You've got a young family. I just wish he would have done it in 2016. And I wish we would have gotten, maybe gotten Paul Nalen into his seat and gotten a Mark Meadows, a Louis Gomer, a Massey, one of these more <laughs> hardcore conservatives as speaker. Hopefully that's what we're going to see when he steps down. I hope the Congress has learned their lesson and they're not going to stick, you know, another, uh, a Bain or Ryan disciple into the speaker's chair office because that would just be disastrous for another two years. Well, look, I mean, I, 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 I hope we have the House after next year. No, and I I'm think, not. Listen, I, I think we we'll could have right. a Democrat win. I don't. I don't know well, if we're going to have a, dem, mean, a Dem win. I think it, it, if they listen to guys like us, yeah, we'll do fine. That's right. Because there's multiple things we need to do. We need to identify 
vulnerable enemy seats and go to take. Well, we need good them. candidates, though, Kurt. We you need you to, nailed it. We need the right. Yes. Look, ten Democrat, ten Democrat Senate seats are up for grabs in 2018 in states yep. that Trump won handily. There is no reason we shouldn't win every one of them. But we've got to get Gal. First of all, we've got to pick good candidates that are killers. Yeah, we don't need any more Jebs. We don't need any more Jebs. We need killers. We Nobody need killers. who thinks that sometimes you're morally obligated to lose. That's exactly, exactly right. And we have 10 seats up for grabs in the upper chamber. We should win every one and get our supermajority. There's no reason we cannot do it. But we've got to get these idiot rhinos to stop being thorns in the president's side, galvanize, and support for a big party win. Yep. That's what we need. All right. That, talk, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Talk to me about love, your new town hall column. Why am I seeing a lot of love coming out of Kurt Schlichter right now? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I decided to give some dating advice in my Thursday uh, uh, column. Uh, there was an intersectional feminist who wrote a uh, uh, 10 questions to ask your uh, uh, partner on a first date. Things like, what do you do to disarm patriarchy? Do you support our Muslim allies? Blah, 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 blah. Oh, it was incredible. So I did some for conservatives. Uh, and, and, and people should check it out. Um, you know, things like, uh, uh, how do you feel about the second amendment? The proper answer is you don't have enough guns. Uh, and that answer should come before you, you, you tell them how many guns you have. You know what you and I need to do? You and I need, well, next time I'm in Los Angeles or you're on the East coast, you and I need to find a liberal speed dating event and just go sit through it for the sheer amusement value oh dear god that would be <laughs> good <laughs> that would be <laughs> do you so greatest... solidarity with the lgtpq and yxw exactly. <laughs> pound sign you know yeah by the time uh, emoji they, our, their five minutes would be up by the time they, 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 they wouldn't get the acronym out before the five minutes was up and i'd be like all but six of them <laughs> Any big plans for the weekend, Schlichter? We ran out of time here. I, I, I could go all day. Yeah, I got a little bit of writing to do, so that oh, should be fun. What's coming on Monday? Can we get a hint? Uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, tell the Republicans what they need to do to keep the House and the Senate. Uh, think they'll listen? I, I, don't, I don't think they'll listen. I, I do yeah, not think so. I, I We're just going to have to do it now. ourselves. I think, I think uh, Jeff Flake will read it, and then he'll start cutting more checks to Democrats. As always, Schlichter, an absolute oh, pleasure. It. Colonel Kurt Schlichter, he's got some interesting projects coming up. You guys are going to want to stay tuned to his Twitter, at Kurt Schlichter. Always a pleasure, my friend. Thanks very much. Thank you. Always a great time with Kurt, and I want to keep bringing that to you, so please subscribe to our premium service at www.therebel.media forward slash shows. If you're already a subscriber, thanks very, very much. You have a great weekend. I'll be back with you on Monday.